We're broadcasting from Ukraine uh, with a honored guest. Uh, we are in the studio of Chromatsky TV, uh, which means public uh, in Ukrainian, a Ukrainian independent uh, network. And uh, it's a special edition of Chromatsky in conjunction with the Atlantic Council. And we will examine what comes after the Ukrainian uh, elections of uh, Petro Poroshenko. What steps does Ukraine need to take to fulfill its dream of being democratic? And I'm joined tonight uh, by my co-moderate David Patrick Karakos, an author and journalist who will moderate the discussion with our three guests. So what we're looking at is, loosely speaking, what is the best way to take Ukraine forward? A new president has just been elected. Things are looking perhaps a little more positive, but great challenges still remain. So we'd like to address some of those tonight with your expertise. So I'd like to start by opening a question to the minister. So we are six months on from Maidan, from the start of the Maidan revolution. Uh, the Ukrainian people went to the polls. They elected a new president. They elected him decisively with a single round. Is it But Independence Square is still full of tents. Is it time for these people to go? Well, I always said that uh, it's good to have Maidan at least mentally and maybe organizationally in Ukrainian politics. And I think Maidan is already in the Ukrainian DNA. Uh, it was twice successful, and uh, I think it will be <laughs> successful if needed uh, future times as well. But uh, what is important, uh, even in our case in the government, is that this constant pressure, constant scrutiny, um, which was basically unheard of. Uh, because as we know, in 2005, uh, Maidan dissolved uh, itself. And that was probably a bit of a mistake. Now, I don't mean to stay physically on the square, but keep the government under scrutiny. Keep the government accountable, keep the government responsible. That's what the society needs through different forms of Maidan. And how would you do that? How would you keep them constantly accountable? Well, now it's easy to do, by the way. Um, in the 21st century, uh, you know, the distance is becoming much closer and the light becoming, uh, is becoming much stronger. Uh, what I mean is the social media. I mean uh, excellent aggressive in the good sense of the word, journalists asking questions, scrutinizing your, your actions, um, putting this all together, that's, that's, that constitutes parts, the important parts of the civil society that, that Ukraine is developing right now. So really there's no need for them still to remain? Uh, that's basically their choice, by the way. But uh, in one form or the other, like for example, we have the Sunday uh, rallies there as well. So that could be uh, another idea. Uh, so some regular reports um, uh, from the government officials, from the from the city officials as well. I think this would be quite a good form of uh, direct de democracy. Right. So what do you think, Adrian, from perhaps a more international view? Because you. People abroad, they look at pictures from Ukraine, and Maidan really has become kind of a shorthand for what is happening in the country. Do you think it's time for them to go? Are they holding the country back psychologically, or do they serve as a reminder of the revolution? Well, I was uh, mindful of the fact that the new president of Ukraine gave two speeches on Inauguration Day, and one word didn't appear in either of them, Maidan. He spoke of the uh, hundred who died in the defense of democracy. He spoke about public controls and being held to account. He spoke about the desire for a new way of, of, of living. And I think that partly one of the reasons that he did not mention Maidan was precisely because the character of the Maidan seems to have shifted the sociology of the Maidan. I don't know if anyone has done detailed uh, examinations of who is there versus who was there, but it seems like it is not the same uh, sociology of uh, uh, the initial Maidan. Many of the people who are in the defense forces have gone uh, and now are risking their lives on the front lines. Other people have receded back and are active in social and civic life. In the intellectual Maidan, which also exists, there's the civic Maidan, there are uh, political forces that have 
you know, and been mobilized by this. So there are a variety of dimensions in this. It's up to Ukrainians. I don't have to uh, traverse the, uh, the traffic of, of Kyiv uh, to, uh, to deal with this. But it seems to me that maybe some compromise could be found, that there should be some residual public space that is devoted to people who, if they want to stay for the foreseeable future, that they should be allowed to stay. But it should be, in my view, as an outsider, diminished to some extent. At the same time, some kind of a long-term memorial has to be planned on part of the territory that, uh, you know, I, I, I find it a kind of an interesting postmodern uh, phenomenon, this, this event. It is part memorial, it is part a real thing, it is part uh, uh, memorialization, and, uh, and, and uh, it's, it's uh, unique in, in the world. It's this permanent thing which has echoes of the past and uh, sounds of the present. Uh, so I'm not sure, I wouldn't be for losing this wonderful uh, mix of uh, postmodern uh, uh, reality. On the other hand, I think that uh, some shrinking of the Maidan is probably uh, called for precisely because the Maidan has spread back into civil sure. society, into civic activism, sure. and into intellectual life.